Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks uh, to uh, Mr. Chairman for very kind introduction. And uh, also thanks to the organizing committee to invite me, uh, give me such great opportunity to talk about a very uh, tricky topic. I have to say, uh, before my talk, I, I declare I have no conflict of interest. And let's come back to the cover slides again. Um, if you wake up uh, completely, we can start to digest the tricky title, as I said, hypothalamic inflammation. Uh, cause or consequence of obesity. First of all, it's sort of chicken and egg question. You probably would not expect a definite answer, but I promise you an uh, answer today at the end of my talk. And secondly, um, do you know how much efforts we put uh, to combat uh, obesity? First of all, I don't have fancy numbers or the map of America to show the severity of uh, obesity. I have two small pieces of evidence. First of all, I come from Institute of Diabetes Obesity. That, that tells something. And uh, secondly, um, instead of to pay attention to slim, young, beautiful girls, the Dutch artists start to move the interest to make statues for obese men. That uh, reminds us how severity of the obesity uh, society becomes nowadays. And uh, how, why it's hypotenomous? Um, well, I, I believe, I assume you come so early in this conference meeting and um, uh, that's because you believe the brain is important. So no matter how much details you know about the brain or these receptors, uh, these pathways, neurotransmitter, neuropeptide, it's a complex network. But I assume that you think brain is important in control metabolism, control metabolic homeostasis, and uh, the metabolic syndrome uh, very much uh, uh, is attributed by malfunction of this uh, network of uh, each of these pathways. Um, well, you may notice that uh, on this map, uh, the center is uh, hypothalamus. That comes with our title, hypothalamic inflammation. So inside hypothalamus, there are some uh, important nuclei, uh, important group of, uh, groups of uh, neurons. Um, if you look at the bottom of the map, there's AGRP MPY neurons and POMC cut neurons located in the nucleus and in human brain, we call it infundibular nuclei. And MPY, AGRP neurons, we generally call it uh, orexigenic because if you give MPY to uh, the rodents in the brain, they will start to uh, eat crazily. And if you delete AGRP, um, they will stop eating and the staff to die, actually. And if you delete POMC or you um, delete uh, MC4 receptor, which is the receptor uh, received alpha MSH, the products of POMC neurons, actually there's also MC4 mutation in human, uh, the individual become obese. So it looks like I, um, from um, here I highlight the neurons. We're talking about neurons, but um, actually neuroscientists work in the metabolism field uh, in the last several decades um, have paid so much attention to the neurons, try to figure out the cellular signaling pathway, all the connections, and somehow we uh, neglect uh, the population, which we call the supporting units, the astrocytes, microglia, and the blood vessels. So the green <coughs> one, if the color is clear here, <coughs> The astrocytes is taking care of the uh, neuronal growth, especially the axon development and the synaptic communication. And microglia is the cleaning work of the brain. Basically, microglia is macrophages uh, derived from the peripheral and enters the brain in very early developmental stage. And there are vessels, of course, uh, bring the nutrients, oxygen, and take away the waste. How does it look like in the real life? So here I give example, the green neurons are POMC neurons. You remember this is um, uh, anorexigenic population. POMC neurons uh, is uh, taking care of inhibit food intake and uh, stimulate energy expenditure. And um, I made sort of 3D reconstruction to show you how this uh, network works. 
the red cells are astrocytes, and later on I bring it to, to white because the projection problem. Um, and the, the blue cells are um, uh, microglia, and the later on I turn into pink because of it's my favorite color. Um, the, you see how these cells are tangled together. Um, well, um, this is a compli complicated network. It looks like very mass, but actually they are organized in a very physiological uh, way and then do their job perfectly in the physiological situation. And I also mentioned uh, blood vessels. These are vessels lined in hypothalamus. And if you look at microglia at the same time, you can see uh, these green tiny cells have a very intensive interaction with the blood vessels. And actually, microglia is our topic today because related to the inflammation, and the microglia is taking care of the immune response and then the major play of uh, inflammatory response in the brain. And um, <clears throat> microglia is very dynamic, I have to say. So if you look at this movement, that reflects the physiolo physiology of uh, microglia. The arms and then we call the process is moving around all the time. These are the microglia GFP uh, labeled uh, cells in mouse brain from uh, uh, ex vivo cultured uh, brain slice. And when we give LPS, uh, you can see how active they are, the process. It looks like it, it's surveying the whole um, microenvironment. Every microglia has its own territory, like astrocytes. And uh, what they're doing there, actually, one of the uh, function is uh, phagocytosis. So how much they can eat? Um, this is some uh, illustration. We put tracer into the blood vessels. It's uh, a rhodamine enabled dextrin, so the tracer can penetrate the blood vessels. This is after eight minutes, all the tracer enters the interstitial area, and then the microglia start to eat them. You see some yellow, this double labeling in the microglia, it's only eight, uh, after eight minutes. And uh, what is the maximum capacity of the um, microglia of this eating behavior? These are the um, examples, so we did some primary microglia culture. And then when they are uh, sticking to the end, uh, the bottom of the culture dish, and we note uh, with microbeads, one micrometer microbeads labeled with uh, green fluorescence. And um, this is after eight hours. You can see from the right side is the entire cell what is there, only the nuclei. It's not uh, filled. All the entire cell body is filled with the microbes. So these cells just eat as crazily as they want, and you cannot control it. That reflects the maximum capacity of the uh, microglia uh, phagocytotic uh, physiology. Um, well, let's, uh, as I said, we want to digest the title. Why, uh, why it's termed as a hypothalamic inflammation? Um, the reason, I mean, it's it's very new research field. Um, the first piece of data come actually four years ago was a collaboration between us and Thomas Hojas in Yale uh, University. At that time, we were interested in uh, high-fat diet induced uh, obesity, what's happening in the brain. So. He did some uh, in natural microscopy study. And then in the center, you can see a GFP MPY. These are the MPY neurons. And then the red colored thing is uh, astrocytes, but this is under high fat that situation. So normally the astrocytes has very thin layer around the uh, neurons, between the neurons, and the between the neurons and the blood vessels. After high fat diet, the astrocytes become enlarged, the end feet. And then this actually looks like this uh, astrocytosis blocks the communication between neurons and neurons and between the neurons and the general circulation between neurons and vessels. So that part should explain why uh, if you have enough nutrition in the peripheral, the obesity individuals still feel hungry, probably there's not enough uh, feedback information from peripheral to the central and sensed by these neurons which is controlling the feeding behavior. Well, um, later on we teamed up with um, another group in Seattle, Max Swass group, and then uh, we went further. 
So the first thing we did is just uh, pick up the hypothalamus of high fat diet animals and we did time course study. Then uh, uh, checked several uh, cytokines and inflammatory signal. This is very easy piece of data, but it's very elegant time course. So you can see even after one day, this is high fat diet, this is child control. Even after one day of high fat diet, uh, cytokines and inflammatory signals start to rise. Although that's interesting by physical response because it declines at day seven and 14 and comes back on 28 days again. We still try to understand uh, what, what, what does it mean is by physical response, but uh, generally there's, there's a cytokine increase, there's inflammatory signal increase upon high fat diet. Therefore, um, at the beginning we name it hypothalamic inflammation actually is sort of inflammatory-like response, um, because um, I heard, um, I was not here, but I heard some uh, of our colleagues called code inflammation. This is some sort of code inflammation. Well, and then we look at uh, the brain tissue again carefully. Left side is child and right side is high fat diet mice. You can see the microglia, this is IBA1 staining, it's an activity marker of the microglia. You can see on the right side, the high fat diet induced obese mice hypothalamus extremely located in the archonucleus or in the human in fundibular nuclei, there's activation of the uh, microglia. The cell body of the microglia becomes bigger and the process becomes more. So they enter the pro-inflammatory stage if we define um, very precisely. And in the meantime, uh, repeatedly, we also see the astrocytosis from the same uh, brain tissue. Well, it doesn't matter. Maybe you think, well, microglia and astrocytes become active, so what? Um, have a time information, they just become active. Uh, they try to deal something. Maybe that doesn't matter if you only see this, but if you see the POMC neurons are lost at the, big, at the, at the end of the high fat diet. This is after um, around eight months of high fat diet in uh, mice. Um, and then, you know, on the right side, it's, it's, um, it's a high fat diet. The staining of POMC is very weak. So either the neurons cannot produce that much POMC to do the job of inhibit food intake and to stimulate energy expenditure, or either the cells are just uh, enters the um, um, uh, autophagy or this kind of stage. Well, um, maybe you still say it doesn't matter, it's in the mice. Um, uh, if it doesn't take place in the human, what's, what's, what's the issue? So we, we uh, collaborate, uh, collaborate with um, uh, Dutch Brain Bank, was funded a long time ago by Dick Schwab. Uh, actually, he now already retired, but still very active uh, in the institute. We connect um, uh, postmortem human brain tissue. There's always discussion about uh, dead brain tissue. So the dead, you cannot just pick up the tissue immediately after death. So you have to wait. There's a postmortem delay. So we match the gender, we match the age, we match the postmortem delay. And uh, we compare to the control and type 2 diabetes patients. That's uh, the beginning with the tissue we can connect because the number is decent. And then we also have BMI data from these patients. And then we look at um, uh, alpha MSH staining. That's the products of PharmC. You can see on type 2 diabetes, uh, postmodern human brain, the alpha MSH neurons are lost. So now it really matters. Still, we don't know what is the connection between the glia activation and the loss of POMC neurons, but there must be something going on. So the first question as a scientist, a basic research scientist, the first question we ask is, ask is uh, what is the cause of um, uh, this infl inflammatory night response or inflammation, simply to say. Well, um, it's caused by high fat diet, but the point is, if you give high fat diet, animal will become obese. So is it obesity or is the diet itself? Now let's come back to the same uh, slides again. The top is uh, well-type mice, standard chow SC, and the no panel is high fat that um, mice, obese. And you can see the microglia is very active on the top uh, uh, corner. And then you take um, uh, leptin deficient OBOB mice or leptin receptor mutated uh, DBDB mice. 
they were all kept under the child diet, but they become very obese. And the body weight actually in this study matched with the wild type high fat diet mice, around 60 gram. And you see the microglia in OBOB mice kept under the standard child, they're not active at all. They even have inactive stage, so the activity is lower than the wild type standard child mice. And the DBDB mice also is it's remarkably less active than the wild type high fat diet mice. Um, the, um, so it's not it's not obesity, it's not the body weight. It's it looks like the high fat diet. So we confirm it is by gave high fat diet to the obese mice, and then after two weeks you can see the microglia become active. So the conclusion here is um, not body weight, but high fat diet uh, controls the microglia activity. And another piece, as I mentioned, the OBOB mice without neptin, microglia is not active at all. So this actually is a new piece of data uh, of obese phenotype people have not described before. So we thought, okay, it's because of lack of neptin. Let's put neptin back to the OBOB mice. You can see even after four days of neptin treatment, well, the uh, body weight decreased a little bit, food intake is decreased a little bit, then microglia activity comes back. Well, then you see, okay, it's high fat diet. What exactly means high fat diet? You eat McDonald's and what's, what's the things from the high fat diet enters the brain? We don't know. So we teamed up with um, uh, Max uh, Binohubi and uh, Martin uh, Bickmeyer in Munich. They are the experts of uh, diet components. And yesterday, Martin has a wonderful symposium about uh, ketogenic diet. Actually, we also, um, so he showed all the data in the peripheral tissue, uh, very interesting. And he didn't show the brain because brain is with us. Um, so we um, gave the ketogenic diet to the animals. You compare the top two, chow and the right side is high fat diet. Again, the microglia get very active. But the diet we use to induce the obesity is high fat diet together with uh, extra sucrose, so extremely high in fat, but also high in carbohydrate. And then the ketogenic diet, you are clinics, you know, what does it mean? Extremely high in fat, but very low carbohydrate. And you see the microglia are not active at all. So what's the issue here is the microglia get activated not only because of the fat, but also with association of carbohydrate. So these two has to be present at the same time to get microglia activated. And then I showed all the data about microglia. What else uh, come with uh, microglia activation and astrocytosis, especially in this uh, specific brain region, arcuinucleus? It's uh, remarkable, it's just the triangle shape. Everything happened in that small brain region. I have to say still, we don't know that much about this nuclei. And then uh, by some accident, we use mouse antibody to stain in the, the, the mouse brain. Basically, we want to study tall neck receptor 4, but uh, we made a mistake. We ordered mouse clonal antibody to uh, detect the tall neck receptor 4. We thought, oh, we have a wonderful increase if you compare left and right. When later on, we find out actually it recognized endogenous IgG. So what happens is you give high fat diet, um, this is 16 weeks high fat diet, actually it's happened in shorter time. There's an enormous amount of IgG deposit in this very tiny triangle area in front of the nuclei or the arcunucleus. And again, this is not obese induced because uh, if you look at OBOB mice kept under the child diet, there's not such IgG deposition. And if you give uh, obese mice, uh, OBOB mice high fat diet, the deposition is even worse uh, compared to the normal high fat diet. And who is eating all this IgG? Where this IgG stays? We co stain with uh, astrocytes and the microglia. And uh, if you follow me to the end of the slides here, this is uh, merged the microglia, astrocytes, and the IgG. You can see the colocalization of IgG. There. Um, exclusively located in the microglia, but not in the astrocytes. Actually, it explains um, partially why the microglia become so big, because they eat so much. You remember this phagocytotic behavior of these cells. And then we have some uh, ongoing study to understand 
who gave these IgGs in the general circulation, or is just because of T cell, B cell located or docking or give some kind of interaction in the local uh, brain region? And uh, Mark Walter, uh, my colleagues, is working on it to uh, dissect the mechanism. And what else? The blood vessels, you remember, we mentioned at network, the glia vessel supporting unit. So we also look at vessel structure after uh, 16 weeks of high fat diet established obesity. And I put tracer into, uh, in the blood vessel, in the tail veins, FATC labeled albumin. And so all the endothelial cells will be labeled and you can see the entire brain uh, vessel structure, actually the entire body structure, uh, vas vascular nature. And you can see on left side is child again, right side is high fat diet. The blood vessel becomes more, and then uh, actually the density also becomes higher. And then we uh, collaborate with Ingo Bachman in Leipzig uh, Institute of uh, Anatomy, and he did uh, an electron microscopy for us. Look at what happens uh, exactly inside um, the vessels. So you can see um, the right side, some of these endothelial cells have uh, degradation changes. So degeneration uh, changes. That probably partially explain that the blood brain barrier is not complete anymore. And um, while this, again, we checked uh, uh, the dead human brain tissue, the same group of tissue we see the half MSH going down. Here, blood vessels, uh, it's a staining of uh, precapillary arterial. And then you see the type 2 diabetes patients, they have much more uh, blood vessels growing there. Here, the postmortem DNA really doesn't matter because you can't imagine if you died six hours, your blood vessels goes up. So we don't need to worry about the delay issue. Anyway, um, so um, for doctors, this probably reminds you the retinopathy in type 2 diabetes. The same thing happened there, we assume, because the, in a retinopathy situation, the blood vessels there's angiogenesis, but the vessels are not really well, very well formed. So the blood cells penetrate from the vessels, leak into the retina and cause, uh, cause blindness. That probably happened to the hypothalamus as well. So the, 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 the newly growing blood vessels are not really well structured. So there's a penetration of peripheral uh, molecules, which normally shouldn't enter the brain will enter this brain region, and um, uh, it will be a difficult task to find out who are those molecules, but we are working on it. Well, um, so you, you are convinced, more or less, I hope, that it's high fat diet with carbohydrate, it's inflammatory response in the microglia when you eat McDonald's, you definitely inflame your um, microglia. So, what else can, my, can increase microglia activity? Um, well, I have to say basic research, we work very hard, but most of the time we prefer to eat, work during the daytime. So we always kill our animal at daytime, and then um, by accidentally, um, some scientists want to work um, when the animals are active. So remember, the rodents, is like mice and rats, they have opposite uh, reason than us. When the light is on, they went to rest uh, stage, they sleep. And when the light is off, turns into dark, they become active, they start to eat, men start to fight, uh, females start to doing hair, like human beings. Anyway, so most of the time, um, we, we always kill animals, sacrifice animals in the light phase and um, so you always see the, the morphology or everything in their resting period. So some scientists said, I have to kill the animals in the dark phase, but they didn't tell me. So with the collaboration, I look at the brain, I said, the microglia is very active. How is it possible? And then it turns out that the animals in the dark phase. So we did very, um, uh, we, we start a completely new cohort to study systemically what's happening during day and night, during the resting and active period, or long feeding and the feeding period, I've said all, all these are associated. So if you kill the animals in the chow at the Nibitum 10 a.m., that's the picture you remember, it's very quiet there. And then if you sacrifice the animal uh, four hours after night's off, 
the microglia becomes more active. Since you have more IBA1 staining, actually all the microglia are IBA1 positive, but the immunohistochemistry reflects how high the activity is. So you see more uh, microglia, and then this is definitely related to the feeding and the locomotion behavior, because if you fast, then they become more quiet, and they can't have nutrition inputs, they just sit there, wait for food, and then the microglia are not active anymore. Well, then remember that the lower panel again comes with a high fat diet, which we usually see the microglia become active. And then you look at midnight, the microglia cannot active further because there's a simple housewife explanation. They're already active. They cannot, you know, they reach the maximum capacity. So there's a, there's a very simple, we're still working on it, probably to dissect the further mechanism. Actually, we want to knock down some uh, clock gene in the microglia to see whether this is really related to autonomic um, uh, um, endogenous clock or is related to, to uh, biological, the central master clock, etc. But the simple information from here is in the child animals, the microglia is still dynamic. And in the high fat diet animals, the microglia become active. They are not dynamic anymore. So um, when we look at the, the, the brain tissue in the child animals confirmed, the IBA1 is the microglia activity. It goes up. And then, interestingly, if you look at um, the cytokines, only TNF alpha goes up, the gene expression, but interleukin 1 beta is not. And then, uh, come back to the f uh, earlier slides, you see the difference between chow and high fat diet. The high fat diet, you have other cytokine goes up as well. So these, the midnight microglia activation and high fat diet microglia activation is different. It's different because the cytokine production is different. Well, um, now you probably move your attention to the TNF alpha. It looks like there's something going on with TNF alpha. Why it's so unique? Uh, incorporate with uh, all this activity, feeding, even day and night rhythm. Well, uh, from the textbook, TNF alpha is it's already complicated. No, no knowledge. Related to inflammation, immune response, I have to say inflammation sounds more detrimental, immune response is more physiological, related to survival issue, but also induced apoptosis, uh, necrosis from the name, and also um, involved in proliferation. So um, the question is, what does a TNFR do in, um, in the brain tissue? Of course, we focus on neurons, because the supporting units from the microglia release TNF alpha. TNF can also act on microglia itself to recruit more immune cells, but in, during day and night, I cannot imagine that takes place. So probably TNF does something on neurons. What is the target of the neurons? Now come back to very simple mind. So during day and night, what do you need the neurons to do? Um, in the dark phase, if you are active, you eat, you need more energy because you need to think, you need to move, uh, etc. You need more ATP. Who produce ATP? Mitochondria. So here come with some basic education. Uh, I cannot say mitochondria physiology. One thing I want to remind you is the mitochondria physiology in neurons are completely different from um, the mitochondria in other cells. Uh, why I say that mitochondria is made in the soma and then produce ATP from there. In most of the cells, if you don't have this projection, um, that's, that's the issue. So we call the uh, mitochondrial bioenergetics mainly controlled uh, the ATP production. But in the neurons, there's a special issue because neurons has a non axon, there's a projection. Um, for example, a tall man with 180. Um, the autonomic neurons from PVN in hypothalamus has to project to uh, the end of your spinal cord, uh, for instance, some parasympathetic neurons, and then the mitochondria has to travel half meter distance to carry uh, the energy uh, supply to the terminals. So the dynamics of mitochondria in neurons are another very important issue. Here I remind you, so not only in the bioenergetics, which taking care of the ATP, uh, ATP production, but also the dynamics moves the mitochondria from soma to the synaptic ter terminals and then come back. So um, anyway, we start to 
um, think about what can we do, uh, mitochondria, there's a, there's a very easy method. We team up with Martin Yastros, uh, he's another group leader in our institute, uh, uh, mitochondria experts, and we have uh, several um, uh, mitochondria oxygen consumption analyzer uh, called Seahorse Machine. Actually, can analyze much more. The company just divided with this machine in a more and more fancy way. Anyway, we took two cytokines. Uh, we remember TNF-alpha and the nuclear one beta. TNF-alpha is unique. Now you throw these two cytokines, either of them, into a cultured hypothalamic neurons and then analyzed by the seahorse machine. So you don't need to really understand what exactly is going on there. You just need to follow the red line here. This is red and then blue. The color is not really clear. So the top line is TNF-alpha group. All you can um, read from here is increase of the basal uh, respiration rate and uh, the maximal respiration rate of mitochondria. In general, that means TNF-alpha stimulates uh, ATP production of mitochondria. And then um, this is one of the data that says, okay, TNF-alpha does something in the neurons to stimulate mitochondrial capacity to produce more ATP that fits our hypothesis. And then uh, I also mentioned that dyma dynamics is important for, for um, the neurons. Uh, so uh, Beata, the good girl, actually, um, she's uh, a Polish scientist that decided to work in uh, Munich. She did fancy uh, primary neural culture. You cannot study dynamics, um, mitochondrial dynamic in, uh, in cell nine because the, even neural cell nine, they don't have this, um, um, really real projection or action growing. This can be only done in primary culture neurons. So Beata did very beautiful primary hypothalamic neuronal culture and we can study more closer to the real life um, uh, images. Let's take away, so the, the mitochondria is enabled by mito uh, YFP, uh, yellow fluorescence, they're all yellow. And then um, here is, an, action terminals, actually cell body is somewhere there. So this is the end point. And there's another cells are not transfected by the virus. It's an antivirus transfection. Well, um, Italian colleague will say this is spaghetti. Chinese will say this is noodles. Uh, it's all produce anti uh, uh, enough energy, but this is just simply, simply mitochondria. Um, in cultured um, uh, terminals, uh, neural terminals. If you can follow me, so the mitochondria has a very interesting phenomenon called fission and fusion. If you follow one of these spaghettis, let's come um, from here. You can see very clear fission, which is a breakdown of the mitochondria in two pieces, and then there's a fusion with another piece. So one of the reasons of fission and fusion is the fusion, if the mitochondria get exhausted on the terminals because they have to produce enough ATP for the synaptic communication between two neurons, and they are tired, so somehow they tell the, 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 the owner says, I am tired, the owner will send more fresh uh, mitochondria to there to recharge them. So to be able to recharge them, you know, first the, the fresh one break in two pieces because it's too long, they travel, and they fuse with the exhausted one to get them fresh, and then they can uh, do their job longer. So this is some sort of uh, basic knowledge. Mitofusion and mitofusion is dynamics. This is special culture um, situation. You see the terminals, but uh, we start another culture situation, which um, we just get uh, rid of um, most of the astrocytes. So the neurons probably uh, form a cluster here and here. So this, uh, these are the axons between two clusters of primary neurons. And you can see the mitochondria, most of them are stationary. So 19 to 95% of the mitochondria just stay in their own location. They move slowly, very slowly, you probably cannot uh, see it. And, and the 5% are in traffic very fast. And they move retrograde or uh, anterograde from the cell body to the terminal or come back. So if you give TNF alpha 16 hours, to the primary culture neurons, you can see the mitochondria become shorter, actually, and they move faster. So this is the um, uh, statistic, statistic result. Uh, well, with these two pieces of data, bioenergetics and the dynamics, 
you are more or less probably convinced that Ting Alpha is important. So what is the mechanism? How does it work? How Ting Alpha, uh, Ting Alpha, Alpha end up um, mitochondria? We have no idea. So let's go back to uh, the textbook. It's already complicated. I thought, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? Uh, where's the mitochondria? I don't have any information. So, um, and uh, from the textbook, I know um, Ting Alpha Alpha has two receptor, receptor one and the receptor two. So I asked my colleague, Mark Walter, um, who's um, in charge of the SH RNA bank or library. Uh, this library contains 80,000 uh, SHRNA to uh, be able to knock down 16,000 of um, uh, genes of uh, mouse genome, but we also have a human uh, genome um, uh, clone. Anyway, so Mark says, yeah, yes we can, but um, how about receptor 3 to 25? I have no idea. There's, there's so many in TNF receptor. Um, but uh, here we go, we, we have to deal with it. So, uh, you know, to study the mechanism, you first have to find out which one, which receptor is connected to the downstream signal. From the textbook, it, there's not enough information. And also another issue is when we look at, um, because the, the canonical idea of TNF alpha, people always think TNF alpha is some sort of preliminary ideas, it's, it's bad. And then, uh, there are some studies uh, study the connection between TNF and the mitochondria. It's always uh, apoptosis, where the mitochondria destroy the mitochondria, where the um, uh, necrosis pathway. But when we look at the necrotic um, uh, signal, it's not there. It's not increased at all. So this is not the necrotic uh, 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 pathway. So like Obama says, uh, let's restart the whole thing. We don't know what's going on there. So I went to um, uh, Dominic uh, Nutter. Uh, he's our bioinformatics and he's building a very complicated database um, to see, you know, you can find every information from there. So we, we restart the entire TNF alpha connection to the mitochondria and fortunately we found some connections. So again, we have a lot of receptors. I didn't line all of them here, but at least you have more details about different receptors connect to the downstream signal and then with a the whole cascade. And there's uh, one molecule called the TNF alpha receptor associated proton one, which connects the track two and MKK6 to the mitochondria. It's a mitochondria chaperone, 80% inside the mitochondria, 20% outside. And also we found something connected to this uh, thread. I didn't draw the line because it's too far with a complex one and then we also have complex four. Anyway, so we started to say we have to do it. What is the easy way to do it? You remember if you give TNF alpha, you increase the mitochondrial capacity. So we use a seahorse, but that's probably the easiest way to do the screening work because you want to knock down all these signals one by one. So we start to uh, knock down um, this, um, this um, uh, uh, SHRNA uh, piece by piece. Now you see we're lucky, we got some positive heat. So TNF receptor uh, super family 11A, 11B and 14 are the positive result. When you give TNF alpha, you can increase the mitochondria oxygen consumption okay in 50%, but if you knock down, there's a 50% shutdown. I can, I, I'd say it's, it's not completely shut down, but you also don't expect it's completely knocked down because it's a complex of uh, uh, receptor. And then uh, other receptor subunit doesn't work. TNF receptor one, it's not uh, mediating the TNF alpha effects on the mitochondria at all. And four and 10, it doesn't work. See, um, and then we follow the same strategy. We uh, checked all these uh, pathway. We have a positive heat with a ne negative heat. The positive heat, for instance, the trap one I mentioned, we have a trap, uh, trap two MKK6, EKK beta, maybe you remember all these uh, signaling pathway, and then we have a complex, one complex uh, ATPs, uh, some ATPs. Um, anyway, I don't need to read those data, but the yellow uh, colored signal are the positive readout. So somehow uh, we sort out the signaling pathway from TNF alpha to the mitochondria. Probably this is the mechanism behind how TNF alpha increased the mitochondria capacity. So um, uh, take another example. I cannot show all the uh, in vivo data because uh, if all this happens in the in vitro, that 
really doesn't matter. You have to test uh, the signal, some key signal in vitro studies. So we pick up, for instance, MKK6 signal, which increase upon TNF alpha, and if you knock down MKK6, the mitochondria doesn't respond to TNF alpha anymore. And we also confirmed if you give TNF alpha, the, uh, the protein uh, level just increase. Uh, MKK6. So we uh, use adenovirus uh, to overexpress MKK6 in uh, medial basal hepatitis, especially close to the arterial nucleus where all these uh, things going on. And then we test with leptin sensitivity some uh, other projects. But it's amazingly, if you uh, look at the red dots at P star 3, which is the downstream signal of leptin. This is the control side. This is the MKK6 overexpression. So you enhance the TNF alpha downstream signal. And you can see this enormous amount of PSTA3. I've never seen such PSTA3 expression uh, in response to, um, to leptin. OK, so this is the, um, the end of my talk. I said I want to give you um, a conclusion. So mm, let's, let's forget about all these complicated uh, results. There are two pieces of simple results. First of all, TNF alpha promote mitochondria capacity to handle the metabolic challenges during day and night with high fat diet, blah. And then you can see the last piece of data. If you over express the TNF alpha uh, downstream signal, signal, MKK6, you have a beneficial effects of leptin sensitivity. So my um, conclusion, at least it's not the cause of obesity, the hepatitis inflammation um, at the maximal physiological level. Um, you can say it's a consequence, but the consequence is not like weak team or something like It's just this inflammatory response is helping the brain region or the neurons or the microenvironment to handle the metabolic stress. So it's something going on, which I think is its beneficial effects. And then we only observe the phenomenon and say, ah, oh, there's a microgrid activation, a cytokine increase. If you understand the mechanism, I have to say it's simple question. It's bad or good? Maybe it's not that too bad. It's some sort of good thing. Um, OK, um, I, um, I would like to give my great thanks to Matthias Chu because he brought me to this field uh, um, uh, not long time ago. Uh, he's the director of the Institute, again, Institute for Diabetes and Obesity in Helmholtz Center in Munich. And uh, thanks to all the members of my uh, group uh, who contribute to this data and all the collaborators inside Munich, uh, inside Germany, and on Earth uh, from the US, from Austria, from um, uh, Netherlands. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>